I want to actually begin with the cover of the book. This is a book that covers over 200 years of history. Um, I am only going to talk about the last two decades of uh, the Pahlavi period, the 60s and 70s, because I think it's more familiar to the audience. And so it could give you an opportunity to you know, maybe raise questions, or you know, we can talk about whatever might be on your mind. Um, but the cover is actually from the Second World War. I was just telling um, some of uh, the members of the audience here how much I love this picture, because um, it's really, I've argued in multiple um, pieces of late and even previously, that the Second World War was a really formative uh, moment, not only for the world, but also for Iran, about which very little is written in European history books. Iranians know how important it is, but European um, historians just sort of uh, think of it as, a, as an abbreviation in the war, the bridge to victory, the sort of this passage of materiel from the south of Iran, from the Persian Gulf, to the Soviet Union. And I love this picture because it shows the, 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 the enormous poverty of people in Iran. Um, because of oil wealth in the 60s and 70s in particular, the image that we have even today of this, this country that's very powerful, that's very rich, and those are also you know, changes that have occurred. But I, I think it's important also to remember where Iran was um, in this time period as well. And so, um, and that there were many people who are nameless um, in this history. Um, and I can't recover everybody, obviously, but, but part of what I like to do, and I am a social historian, is to help us remember that even if we don't have sources or the voices in the moment, there are other ways that we can remember um, how people lived and what they went through and how they suffered um, during these upheavals in the history of Iran. Um, yeah, I also just, I'm just gonna kind of move on. I'm gonna begin on a personal note. Um, I'm beginning on a personal note because my father was actually a PhD graduate of Stanford University. <laughs> yep, um, and he got his PhD. You can see it. I actually took a picture of the library <laughs> of his dissertation, um, and I and I have it there for you. His his dissertation was called "Membrane and Bending Theory of Multi-Span Elliptic." Parabol par paraboloid uh, shells. I have no idea what the hell that is. And if anyone does, you can feel free to like try to explain it in lay terms. Um, but so, you know, he um, was probably a hand, one of a handful of people at the time to get a PhD from Stanford in Iran. And he always loved Iran. So, you know, of course he went back. And you see here a picture with Mr. Moshtezi. They were both Rashdi, of course. Um, and so, here is, is, I love this picture because my father was also, um, you know, he um, was important and involved in, in, in helping to build the vaunted engineering programs of the University of Tehran, but also Arya Meher University, which became Sharif University. Sorry, I had to point to my dad, so he's there. Um, but <laughs> I don't have much more to say um, except that you know, although my talk today is not about, you know, the history of engineering in Iran, although I am working on it, um, it does nonetheless, I think, reflect the deep networks that have connected American and Iranians of different eras for decades, including through these educational ties um, that remain important to this day. So the subject of um, U.S.-Iran relations is one that has generated tremendous interest, one that will continue scholarly debate, um, and there are many works on it, including many important ones by Dr. Milani himself, which have shed light on our understanding of this relationship. And so when I started to work on this project back in 2001, I'm ashamed to say that it took me so many years and decades, actually, to finish it. And it's OK. I tell my students the same thing. Sometimes it's OK. You know, it sits there. It's like, it's like Siutoshi. You know, it sits there. And you hope that it gets even better with age. You know, I'm, I'm not sure that's necessarily the case. But that's what I tell myself, especially as a Rashti. You know, we like our Siutoshi. So this, this has been you know, sitting there for quite a long time. And it really started as a book that was inspired um, after 9-11 because um, I live in New York City. My husband was very close to um, one of the, you know, uh, to the World Trade Center. He was actually in one of the buildings that was partly damaged. And so it was very, it was very emotional, you know. Um, and yet, as as Iranians, as Muslim Americans, it was also hard to be a part of the story of America's tragedy in that moment. Sometimes, um, and so 
I had a wonderful department chair, and he said, you know, you really should write about this stuff. You should write about your own experiences, particularly as a woman. Most of the books we have that cover a span of 200 years, I hate to say this, but they are mostly written by men. And so um, my department chair actually said, you know, we need some different voices, different ways of connecting this history. And I think part of the reason why it took so long was because of that, that it was covering such a large span. Um, but so I, I started this book in that time period. Um, and, um, you know, I, and one of the other things I tried to do, and then the period that I was working on it, so many other books were published on um, uh, the United States and Islam, or Islam in America, um, and the US and Iran. And so I had to find a niche for myself as more and more things were getting out there. And so in this book, I really try to focus on the history of US and Iran through the perspective of Iran. I give prime of place to Persian sources and to Iranian voices. Um, and I also um, try to bring in not just diplomatic documents, but also documents that shed light on social and cultural history and social and cultural change um, in the United States and, most importantly to me, as a historian of Iran and Iran itself. Um, and so I track, um, and then the other thing I try to do is I follow two parallel discourses, particularly in the 60s and 70s. I look at statist, uh, you know, kind of conversations that are being had, but I also look at dissident conversations. So these sort of two parallel discourses that sometimes sound the same but aren't always the same at all. Um, so I'm going to begin um, the actual sort of the meat of the lecture um, so yeah, I guess I've kind of gone through all of this, yeah. Revisiting the history of Iran in a global context. Um, and again, not looking uh, principally at American diplomatic correspondence. Um, and then these were some of the lacunae that I tried to fill in my work. Um, so mostly, as I say in the last section, is evaluating the impact of social change on America and Iran. And I also look at three settings in this talk. I look at, uh, or you know, three settings in which this takes place or that I focus on. One is Iran and the civil rights movement in America, um, Iran, the US, and the Arab-Palestinian-Israeli conflict, um, and Iran and global decolonization focusing on Senegal, South Africa, and Vietnam, very briefly, because it's a big topic, so I can only just sort of touch it. Um, and then within that, there are three major themes of domestic concern, human rights, which I'm sure should not shock anyone, um, repression, that also shouldn't shock anyone, uh, political prisoners, and then I end with women, culture, and the public sphere. So I begin in this moment in 1968 um, um, when uh, Iran actually hosted the first United Nations uh, Human Rights Conference, um, which ran from, which opened from April 22nd until May 13th, 1968. Um, approximately 123 nations, along with several UN agencies, sent rep representatives to Tehran as participants in the conference. Although uh, Geneva, Switzerland had originally been mentioned as a possible host to this convention, marking the 20th anniversary of the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was issued in 1948, um, Tehran attained this honor. And the change in venue likely reflected the evolving composition of the United Nations, whose membership had expanded to many non-Western um, states since its inception. So Iran, of course, unsurprised, unsurprisingly, invoked its civilizational legacy in upholding the first charter of human rights as articulated and preserved, as we well know, in the Cyrus Cylinder. So the conference, um, intended to address inequalities in gender, wealth, and race, um, brought to Tehran many luminaries, including Burmese uh, diplomat Utant, uh, the first non-Western Secretary General of the United Nations. As the Shah delivered his opening remarks in French, his speech was simultaneously translated into multiple languages and broadcast via radio and television to millions of international audiences. Missing from the conference were representatives from communist China and East Germany, an indication that the conference had already become politicized despite the quote unquote universal recognition of human rights. Um, and Iranian dissidents were also absent from these proceedings. Now, invariably, the conference in Tehran in 1968 was compared with um, Bandung in Indonesia, which was convened in 1955 by Sukarno of Indonesia, Jawaharlal Nehru of India. And both of these countries, and of course Nasser too of Egypt, both of these countries uh, were emerging from colonialism and faced the complicated task of state building. Um, and by contrast, you know, Iran 
and this is often how it is um, described, was being led by an autocrat that, as we know, an Anglo-American coup had placed again on the throne. So just five years earlier, in 1963, the uprisings known as Punzai Hordad, or June 5th of 1963, um, sort of brought Ayatollah Khomeini to prominence. And the clashes in, these, in this uprising led to violence from both sides that the state police put down harshly. So to many skeptics, Tehran was therefore an odd choice um, as the site for the first human rights conference. Um, and so, um, um, yeah, and, and this was an idea that had really gained urgency um, after the Second World War. And on the whole, the conference was a mixed bag. On the one hand, there were an increasing number of nations that participated in it um, as compared with Bandung. And on the other hand, the country, countries represented at the conference were dictatorships, much like Iran itself. So this is sort of one of the ironic legacies of it. But in my work, I argue that even though this was the case, so there are many things that you can say was negative about it. In fact, the newspaper Etelat very sardonically said, no decisions were, raised, ra I mean, were reached at the conference, and it called it conference uh, bitasmimi, because you know the conference of indecision, because very few decisions were reached. Nonetheless, I argue that um, for Iranians um, in particular, this was a really important moment. Um, and even though the conference was silent, on domestic problems, um, and you know it wasn't open to everybody, certainly not to people in um, what might be considered the communist bloc or what was known as the communist bloc. Nonetheless, um, it really brought to the fore um, the issue of global civil rights um, and race relations in, in many parts of the world. Now, and also sort of the dire, um, the dire sort of conditions that necessitated decolonization which as a concept in Persian is referred to as um, or Zedoi or Zede um, And by the way, in the time periods so on the 60s, we didn't, we use the word Esemar was used, but these other sort of phrases were not commonly used. But there was obviously a conversation about, you know, the legacies of, of imperialism, even though Iran was never a formal colony. Um, and we also know that um, Iranian uh, writer, um, Jalal al Ahmad, had also written his work, Rab uh, Zadigi, which I translate as Westernitis. Other people have used other words to translate it. Um, but also, these intellectuals were not a part of the conference. Now, the focus on global uh, racial rights um, defined the early sessions of this conference. Um, and here, there's a dinner actually that was hosted by Hoveda and his wife. Um, and so you see here, you know, many different um, members of, um, you know, represented. And there weren't very many women, actually, I have to say, at the Human Rights Conference. And that was one of the other ironic legacies of it, because among the themes that they wanted to talk about was gender. And yet there were very few women in positions of leadership, um, or even as spouses that had come to the conference. So for Iran, the conversation about civil rights was, and actually at the conference, um, the United States and South Africa in particular, we're talking the 1960s, were really you know, um, under scrutiny. Um, they were very much under scrutiny at the conference. Again, if you look at even mainstream newspapers, such as Etelot, which does, has a very um, sort of um, robust coverage of it, um, it is very clear that the theme of race and racial inequality in different uh, locations um, is, is really on, you know, is, is really on people's minds um, and, and, and written and is sort of uh, kind of one of the main themes of the conference. Um, and so this is also um, significant because um, we see here, so um, the United States had uh, initially sent, or had planned on sending Averill Harriman um, to Iran as, as its representative to the conference. But Harriman was then um, called in to go do some kind of negotiation for um, Vietnam, and instead Roy Wilkins, who as I point out was the head of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, was sent as America's representative. Um, and this was very important because Roy Wilkins um, actually goes there, um, and he delivers a speech in which he references the Shah's, of course, controversial white revolution, 
Um, but he also talks about, you know, he really tried to uh, draw a comparison between the fundamental teachings of the prophet Zoroaster and the ethos of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was also, uh, and, and as Wilkins said, he said, the Universal Declaration points the way for ordered liberty. It encompasses two of the abiding principles of the great Iranian teacher Zoroaster. And so he talked about, you know, good words, good acts, good deeds. So it was really an effort on his part to kind of, um, you know, nod to the history of Iran and, the, and sort of the history of Iran through um, the teachings of Zoroaster. Now, just, just prior to this, Dr. Martin Luther King had been assassinated in the United States. And so at the conference, there was a moment of silence. There were several um, sort, of, sort of people um, who recognized that Dr. King had been killed. Um, and there were several references to that, actually, um, in the conference itself. And um, Wilkins also uh, talks about the fact that you know, um, you know, he's here even though the flags in the United States are still at half mast because of the assassination of Dr. King. Um, and so this was really a really important moment, I have argued, for Iran, because Iranians really weren't that familiar with what was going on um, in terms of race relations in the United States. I, I, I would say, I always say it's sort of like there was ignorance, but it's sort of like, or cluelessness and ignorance, but a desire to not be so um, unaware in this time period. Um, and so one of the things that to me really encompasses or sort of exemplifies the cluelessness of Iranians in this time period is when um, Malcolm, the, Mal Malcolm X was assassinated in 1965, in fe February of 1965, the Persian newspaper, both Kehan and Etelad, this is from Etelad, but Kehan also has uh, uh, er erroneously identifies him as Malcolm the 10th instead of Malcolm X, not realizing that the X referenced his um, rejection of, of his slave name. Um, and so I, I know, it, it, you can't make this stuff up, really. Um, and so that's why I always encourage my students to go through, you know, do really rigorous archival research, because you know, it's, it's when you do that close reading that you find things. And it's also very, as we say, it's very sort of reflective of that era. Now, I will say that there were Islamist newspapers in this time period that actually were much more in tune um, with the suffering of black Americans in this time period. Um, they had far smaller circulation than these, uh, you know, the, the state newspapers did in that time period. They did not refer to Malcolm X as, as you know, Malcolm the 10th. They knew his name was Malcolm X, and they wrote X, X in, in Persian. Um, and so there was much more awareness, but I've also argued that some of those Islamist uh, newspapers I, I think had that interest because they were also, there was this essentializing element in the way that they were you know, sort of um, drawing on these Islamic uh, connections as well. So, so, so race was certainly one of the main themes of the conference and it was important because also in the deliberations of the majlis in, in Iran, um, there were conversations about it. So this is a moment that you know, enables Persian representatives or political representatives also to come to terms with um, what was happening globally in this time period. And we can say more in the question and answer if, if you're interested. Now, another way in which um, race relations was being sort of invoked was through literary writings um, and, you know, there, and through translations of Francophone works. Um, and one of the ones that you know, I think is really very interesting is the writings of the poet um, and president of Senegal, Leopold Sadar Senghor, who actually came to Tehran in 1976, and he received an, an honorary doctorate. And what's interesting is um, when he was given this honorary doctorate, um, uh, Mahmoud Ali Aslami Nodushan um, wrote about him and you know, uh, gave a speech that was published. And then what's interesting about Nodushan's writings on, on Senghor is he really didn't want to uh, engage with Sangor as a, as a political figure. He was really drawing on the poetry of Sangor. So it was more Sangor the poet rather than Sangor the president. Um, and he was drawing a connection between you know, his, his literary writings and Iranian and Persian mysticism. So I thought that was really interesting how he was trying to find these connections between um, um, sort of the experiences of um, this you know, one particular um, intellectual um, and sort of find some resonances in Persian um, in Persian um, mysticism. So the next subject <laughs> that I'm going to talk about, um, and this is also very interesting too, because 
Um, the reason why today's talk is really on these two decades is because so many things were happening, and they were happening simultaneously. So, you know, you had on the one, and there was, the world was a mess. If you think it was a mess, it's a mess today, and it is. It was a mess then, too. Um, and so, you know, for Iran and within the Middle East itself, there were a lot of things that were happening. The map was continually changing. There were still, you know, uh, national contestations and so forth. Um, and so Iran, Iran found itself in a very kind of precarious place um, in this time period as well, particularly vis-a-vis -vis, um, the larger Arab world. Um, and again, we have to be really careful to recognize that the Arab world was not monolithic, despite the fact that we use the phrase Arab world, which you know, encompasses many, many different countries. Um, there were internecine conflicts, of course, and Iran's relationship with different states really varied, as we well know. But on the issue of um, you know, um, what was happening between the Palestinians and Israel, in 1947, Iran voted against the partition of Palestine and supported instead the minority plan for a federated state. And as a Muslim dominant country, but of course one that adhered to the less numerous Shia persuasion, um, and as a predominantly non-Arab state, Iran sort of recognized its unique position in the conflict between um, Arabs, Palestinians, and Israel. And so Iran's approach, I've argued, um, to this conflict was one of what I've called furtive friendship and guarded engagement. Um, what does that mean? Well, it's exactly that. It's, it's furtive friendship. So there was real concern about Iran, you know, very overtly um, embracing Israel. Um, and in fact, there were, are countless, I um, talk about it in the book, there are countless um, documents, memoranda particularly, Nasser frequently attacked the Shah on this front, um, but also um, Arab League as well, um, on occasion um, also was very, very critical uh, of the Shah for his overtures to Israel. Um, and at the same time, Iran also knew that it had to maintain harmonious relations with a fractured Arab world. And so, um, this is also a complicated uh, period for Iran because the, the relations in you know, the Persian Gulf that we call the Persian Gulf, but Arabs and many, many Arabs and people in, um, you know, in, in what became the new states of the southern Persia Gulf call the Arabian Gulf. And then some people try to be neutral, which I've argued is not really neutral. But anyway, um, and others too, um, they refer to it as the Gulf. Anyway, so it was a complicated time. Um, um, also in, in the southern uh, uh, borders of Iran. And so, you know, somehow the state had to navigate um, this, this, this sort of complicated relationship. Um, and things really uh, get much more polarized, as you would imagine, after the 1967 war, where the Iranian public expressed sympathy for and a great deal of solidarity with Arabs, Palest uh, Arabs and particularly with Palestinians. Um, and the Shah himself um, supported um, Palestinian aspirations to statehood um, and did not acknowledge the legitimacy of Israel's occupation, even going into the 1973 war and at the end of it in the Majlis, and I've cited this in a fairly recent article, it's also in the book, um, you know, the, uh, the Iranian state's position frequently was to uh, support Resolution 242, uh, which is this sort of imperfect resolution um, that does that you know um, advocates a land for peace essentially in a, in, a, in a nutshell, and so they continue to sort of um, maintain that position, which by the way is similar to a position that even in the current conflict Saudi Arabia um, is is advocating in parts as well because they're saying we're not you know recognizing the occupation of of territories acquired after 1960 or through the 1967 war. So, um, and this, so this was a, another complicating factor that was happening um, in this time period. And by the 1973 war, so once Nasser dies in 1970, um, the relationship with Egypt actually changes and there's more of a sort of, there's more um, detente with Egypt. The Shah, as we well know, had a, a good relationship with Anwar Sadat um, and Iran was also called upon in private diplomacy to try to sort of ease the relationship between Egypt and Israel um, in this time period. And so relationships warmed um, in a way that they had never been really 
actually with, 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 with Nasser. And of course, the Shah probably remembered the very warm embrace that Mossadegh had received when he had um, gone to, um, you know, he'd gone to Egypt on his return um, trip from the United States. So that's probably something that was also, you know, something that you know, bothered him, I would imagine. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so that's basically uh, the story there. The one thing I want to point out is that, so here's a good example of how the state had a particular posture, right, on this conflict. But the Persian popular press was really very pro-Palestinian, I would argue, and they very much pushed back against this idea of um, Israel as, you know, what they viewed as Israel as more of an aggressive state um, and one that had acquired these territories. And a lot of that actually became reflected in um, the political cartoons of that time period, and particularly even in the depiction of Moshe Dayan and later also of um, Golda Meir. So here, um, this is a particular um, um, sort of um, cartoon in which, you know, this figure approaches him, or it says, you know, and the, the, the newspapers are reporting that uh, Moshe Dayan has uh, agreed to deal with the situation of hunger in the occupied territories, and this person who's nameless, it's not referred to as a Palestinian, but you can sort of, you can see that it is gesturing um, to the Palestinian cause, asks Moshe Dayan, so how are you going to alleviate hunger? And then he re replies, I'm going to fill all these lands with um, with lead, and that's how I'll fill, fill everyone up, is by filling up the lands with lead. So this is very, this is a very, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very stark indictment, obviously, of Moshe Dayan and of the Israeli state, which became sort of in many ways represented by Moshe Dayan, because he was the victorious general. But one thing that's very funny is they've actually patched the wrong eye of Moshe Dayan. It's actually his left eye <laughs> that was, you know, that was, um, that needed to be patched, but here you see the right eye. So it didn't really matter, but, but I think the image pretty much tells it all. And there's a couple of others um, that I have here as well, um, particularly in the Nixon period. Um, and I have argued, too, that the depiction of um, Golda Meir, in my view, is also somewhat misogynist. He's off, she's often viewed as this you know, a decrepit, decrepit woman, um, you know, and so there are a lot of, I think, and also depictions of Arabs are also very, I would say, racist um, on the Iranian side, sort of um, not necessarily, you know, very stereotyped in a very negative way. Um, and you can argue that cartoons, to some extent, that's the function of cartoons, right? They, they push the limits of propriety. They push us. They make us uncomfortable, and, and they make us cringe. But I think as scholars, I think it's important for us to point out that there are these types of stereotyping that, in my view, you know, advocate some kind of discrimination for sure, and, and racism as well. Um, but here, I think the other message that we get, particularly in this one, is you know, the, the, how the relationship, um, how the impact of the US arming of, of Israel in, in this conflict really um, um, undermines um, sort of the image of the U.S. and Iran through these cartoons. You really get to see that in the popular, in the popular press, and that's very different, though, from the state discourse. So I just again I want to be really clear that there are two parallel discourses happening in this time period, and we can talk about it in the Q and A if you're interested. Now we're going to mosey on to another really big theme in this time period, which was um, the Vietnam War, and. Just like uh, you, uh, uh, America's posture in the um, Palestinian um, and Arab, Palestinian slash Arab and Israeli conflict, um, Iran, I mean, um, the, United, the stance of the United States in the Vietnam War made it hugely unpopular in Iran. There were Iranian journalists who traveled. There were many Iranian writers who wrote about it. My mom's first cousin actually um, has a piece in one of the um, Persian periodicals of, the peri of that time, Sohan. He wrote, um, and, and I actually, I say this, I, I asked him if he remembered anything about that issue. He didn't remember much, but he, he did say that that, you know, for, for his generation of journalists and writers, there really was in some ways no conflict more sort of sinister than, than the Vietnam War. Um, and so this was depicted again in multiple images that you see. I'm not going to go through each one, but the gist of all of this is to say that US money and US arms were basically ineffective. 
that, that this conflict uh, has not been won by the U.S. despite, you see here very clearly, you know, the money, the picture of Uncle Sam, um, sort of, again, um, you know, the image of Uncle, uh, Uncle, Sa Uncle Sam. You know, so all of these images basically are, are saying um, that American arms and American money have not made it, um, have not enabled it to sort of justify this war. And certainly it did not um, in any way um, sort of um, uh, make uh, Americans um, or the American state beloved um, in many sort of global contexts. Now I want to also begin. So there again, so internationally I've tried to give you a picture of what Iran was like um, in terms of not only regional diplomacy, but also its engagement with themes of global decolonization. So themes that not only Iran, but not only the Middle East, but in many parts of the world, including within the United States as well, they were very, very deeply contested, such as the Vietnam War. And also um, you know, the conflict between the Israelis, Israelis and the Palestinians as well. So that was one other dimension. So we've had, you know, the first part of the talk was about the racial conflict. And of course, in images of the Vietnam War, I, I don't want to uh, be remiss in saying this, there's also a lot of Iranian racism toward um, people of um, East Asian descent. You know, So you see a lot of um, very kind of unfortunate, um, again, othering and ways of depicting people of a different ethnicity and, and racial um, um, experience. And so, you know, so Iran itself, like, you know, it, it was exuding things and behaviors. Some of it is, I would say, out of cluelessness, but some of it genuinely, I think, there is racism, you know, and, and there was and is, you know, a lot of racism that wasn't depicted or, or what was depicted but wasn't talked about. So I think now looking back like 70, 80 years, it's incumbent on us to kind of look at some of those images um, and with much more racial awareness that we have to be able to sort of unpack what was happening within Iran itself, uh, and including, including in, you know, um, in, in, in these cartoons. So then the, third, the other part, before I get to the final part of the paper, the, the next thing that I want to talk about is the sexual revolution. So, you know, we associate the sexual revolution in the United States with the 1960s as well, a moment of liberation, a moment of, you know, women experimenting with fashions, with, you know, sh shorter skirts, the mini skirts, the bikini. These are all really well-known um, changes, social changes that occur in this time period. But these same kinds of, and also, of course, nudity, right? You know, pornography, the place of pornography in, 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 in you know, in, in, in everyday life. Um, and so these ideas are also, shockingly maybe to some, um, are also being talked about in Iran. I was really, really just flabbergasted when I found this particular article. It's a translation of an interview with Hugh Hefner um, that appears in a very popular, but sort of, you know, sort of, um, I would say more um, highfalutin kind of intellectual journal um, of this time period in the 1960s, um, where this interview is translated. Um, and so it's, I thought it was really kind of um, daring to have in Iran of the 1960s such an interview, and you know, it might have surprised us, it certainly surprised me when I saw it, um, that there was such a degree of conversation and openness on the issue of, of, of um, you know, what, what the philosophy of, of Playboy was, you know, why this was taking off, what was happening, and to have Iranian intellectuals write about it, I thought was even more telling for in this time period. But I argue that this is part of the discomfort that many more conservative um, individuals in Iran felt when you know these types of when individuals or intellectuals or whoever women themselves were pushing the limits on what was considered or what some people saw as women's place in society and how people, how women needed to look. Because we know in different parts of Iran's history, um, these types of um, expectations are imposed on women, whether it's unveiling, whether it's you know, veiling or whatever. And so this is also a part of the, the dynamic here that I wanted to bring to your attention. And also to show the extent of openness about these ideas that might have, have surprised some of us. I know it surprised me, I'll tell you that. But if the rest of you are not surprised, that's fine too. <laughs> now, I always juxtapose this with um, 
the statement that Alia Shariati, who's you know um, um, is well known as one of the writers and ideologues of the Iranian Revolution, um, and so when you read so. So on the one hand, you have that. And this is one of my favorite quotations in English from Alia Shariati. I first came across it when I was a graduate student. I wrote a paper. I can't believe it. And then it got published years later. But it did get published. But it had started when I was a graduate student. Um, and I love this. I'm just going to read the whole quotation or part of it. He says, we have no right to know Angela, meaning Angela Davis, who was the activist for, um, on behalf of uh, prisoners um, in the United States. We have no right to know Angela, the American girl in prison, who is not only the hope of two countries, but of all the free people of the world, of all the wounded, all those condemned through humanity's racial discrimination, the oppressed. We only have the right to know Madame Twiggy. Um, you know, and as the final level of the ma ideal manifestation of Western civilization, the queen of 71, and along with her, the highest form of European woman, Jacqueline Onassis, who uses her money as a means of exchange for everything, Bibi and the Queen of uh, Monaco, and all the seven female uh, guards around James Bond. I mean, that's really kind of funny, you know, because when you do see James Bond, you sort of do, and we did in the 1970s Iran. Those were some, anytime a new, you know, James Bond movie came, it was sort of like, oh, it's time to try to get a ticket to go. You know, I don't know how many of you, you know, were there in Iran in the 1970s. I see some people shaking their heads, yeah, I mean, nodding their heads, yeah. So, you know, da James Bond movies were. I, for good or bad, you know, they were popular. And so it kind of does ring out. But, and so his Shariati has a point too. And there's been a lot of criticism uh, of journals such as Zaniruz or Etelat Bonovan because, you know, and when you look at it, I mean, all the women are very young, most of them. Um, you know, they're, they're uh, they most, but not all, actually, because I've spent a lot of time looking at different um, issues, almost all the issues. Um, and so sometimes, surprisingly, you do find um, or maybe not surprisingly, but I, you know, you do find articles that um, are more sort of substantive about issues such as um, such as you know cultural change and, and fashion and, and whatnot. But by and large, the critique that people you know, like intellectuals like Shariati ha had of, of, of that. Um, that those types of um, journals was that they objectified women, um, and women were very westernized. They were forced, the idea is that they were forced to be westernized, that it was not necessarily a choice, but it was what was being touted and was being sort of privileged um, in, um, in a society that at the time, because it had very close relations with the West, of course also promoted Western values, which this was associated with Western values. But I have argued that Shariati had his blinders too. Why? Because I think that he couldn't see women as sexy and smart. Women had to be one or the other. So you know, imagine the, you know, here we are at Stanford University. So you can be sexy and smart, right? And so I think that that's, um, um, part of what I would argue we have seen and we continue to see, particularly with the women life freedom movement, is this: is this you know a, a push against constantly creating these binaries in gender and for women. Yeah, it's one or the other. It's this or it's that. It's you know this the pre-Islamic period. It's the post-Islamic period. And really, it's much more complicated than that, as we know. And I really like these particular images because this is a woman who writes against this man who comes from abroad and you know, he, he exemplifies in some ways all the critiques that Shariati anticipates. He says, oh, Western women are better like spouses. And so she writes back and she says, I've never seen anything like that. We Iranian women you know, are, are you know, much more, um, we, our value is much more than that, uh, that we need to sort of compare ourselves to you know, foreign women. And so you can see that there is this really engaging debate kind of going on among Iranian women themselves. And it was also in the same issue of uh, graduates of, uh, you know, women graduates um, from um, uh, university graduates in Iran in that time period. Um, so the final thing I want to, the final uh, comments that I'd like to make um, take us into the 1970s. Um, and this is, of course, a very well-known celebration. You, you know, most Iranians and even non-Iranians know it, the celebration of 20, 2,500 years of monarchy, um, which was you know, very extravagant, as we well know. Um, the who's who of the world ended up there, you know, the who's who in terms of 
um, you know, ho Hollywood stars, all the famous monarchs, whatever. Queen Elizabeth did not come. There are others also who were notably absent. But this was, you know, this was, this was the moment of the big show. Um, and ironically, actually, this um, moment, for those of you who remember this in the middle of the revolution, and here I'm going to gesture to my brother because he certainly remembers it. Um, this was actually um, derided by the Iranian poet Hodi Khorsandi um, in, the, in, the, in months before the revolution. So as you all know, the Shah made a statement here, you know, repose, kuros, for we are awake, behov, kuros, you know, very famously. And so a couple of years later, so in 1978, when things have gotten really have gone very wrong for the for the Shah, Hadi Khorsandi sort of writes this satirical poem that at the time was not published but was copied and passed around in schools. And somehow my brother got a hold of it. I don't know how, but maybe he'll one day tell me how. Um, and so he also copied it and it passed, but passed it got passed around. Um, but that poem can actually now be accessed on Golag. It was published, um, and you can go online. But I'll just uh, I'll just recite the first part of it in Persian for. Those of you who understand, he says, "Khoda yek shab be khab shah amad, khomeini bo khoda hamra amad. Shah shah javan mard javan bakh, ze vahshat dar zamin uftad az takht. To gui tebre farman elahi furu uftad az az takht shay." And so it's you know he continues, and then in one other section he says, "Bi akurosh ke ma falan kardim inja." It begins with re. You know, I think you know what I'm talking about. Bi akurosh ke ma falan kardim inja. And so so. So we can see that there was a lot of cynicism um, around this moment. It was heavily criticized. It has been studied by in a book by Robert Steele, my colleague. Um, and so, um, but 1971 was also a, a turbulent year for Iran. There was a lot of um, there were a lot of uprisings. The Siachal uprising took place. For those of us who are from the north of Iran, we know this you know crisis very well. Um, and the people who were involved in it, the youth who were involved in it, were apprehended and killed and even televised, uh, uh, televised, uh, yeah, part, yeah, the, the, it was partly televised. And so, and so this is also a moment which, you know, you can um, really begin to see how uh, the Shah's uh, human rights record, um, even if exaggerated, and it was exaggerated, um, you know, was was really following him everywhere. Um, you know, most in many European capitals, it was. Uh, you, you know, there were always demonstrations, or often demonstrations, um, in the United States as well. And so it, be, it was becoming more and more complicated for the West, and particularly the United States, to figure out how to kind of reconcile supporting someone with such a negative reputation and with such a sort of. Um, such a sort of a record of autocracy within its country. Now, I know there are, there are going to be individuals who you know say, well, um, you know, there were other autocrats in the region, and that's also true, but that doesn't make it any better. I just <laughs> kind of want to make that clear. Um, just because there are more d d dictators doesn't mean that dictatorship is good. It just means that it's just a bad thing all around. Um, is what I'm trying to say. And so basically, you know, this was an issue that after, as we well know, after 1953, the Shah kind of returns to Iran unsure of his mandate. Um, unsure of his mandate, it's after this time period that Savak is created um, in 1957. Um, and so things just really kind of, um, and again, as, as, as a leader who is unsure of his mandate, um, I would argue he, he took a lot of missteps. I mean, there were a lot of mistakes that were made. Um, and yeah, certainly there was plenty of blame to go around. But this is um, one of the, um, and one of the sort of archival material that I was using. I found this image um, that I thought I wanted to sort of show, to you, show you to sort of emphasize how um, Iranian students in particular were um, publicizing and kind of um, 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 generating um, sort of activism um, against, against the Shah in this time period. Um, and finally, the conclusion. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Um, so I wanted to sort of conclude by pulling it all together. So 1960s and 70s Iran was a very complicated place. There were a lot of contradictory things going on. On the one hand, the Shah takes on the very sort of um, 
I guess, revealing title of Oriomer, so Light of the Aryans. He's calling himself Light of the Aryans. But on the other hand, he awkwardly tries to seize, you know, invoke and seize Cyrus's other legacy as sort of this protector of human rights. Um, and, you know, on the one hand, as I said, he himself is kind of, he, uh, you know, he, he, he has a uncertain uh, kind of relationship with race. But on the other hand, he, ex he expands Iran's uh, ties, diplomatic ties, to, uh, to over 31 uh, African countries in this time period, and also other um, uh, countries uh, of the global south. Um, and then the second thing I want to talk about is what I call Iran split identities. I really love this because I, I think that many of us as Iranians also share this. <laughs> we all have sort of somewhat split identities. So, but certainly the country I would argue did as well. So is it secular? Is it religious? Is it national? Is it regional? Is it imperial? Is it you know, somewhat colonized? And so grappling with these sort of binaries made it a very complicated time um, for Iran in that time period as well. And so all of this became reflected, or much of this became reflected in the fractured political writings of the post-Mossadegh era. And then finally, I want to say that the state reprised some of these themes, um, um, uh, reprised some of the themes of race and colonialism, despite its embrace of an imperial and controversial past. And so, um, you know, I think that when you look at the history of, and the history of US-Iran relations really ref, um, sort of spoke to all of the controversies that I've covered in this talk today. Um, so it really spoke to how, um, you know, um, Iranians internalized um, the um, Vietnam War, but it also shows the kind of two levels of discourses that we had. You know, how the state, I mean, for example, the Shah, you know, was, you know, did stand by the United States, but um, Iran also provided some um, um, medical care um, during the Vietnam War. And so, you know, th um, things were not always very um, clear cut, um, and it was not always easy to draw these lines. I think I'm done. Thank you so much. <laughs>